Again, Michael Amundsen, I work with a great company called Layer 7, and what we work to do is uh, help people build great APIs and expose their information on the internet to improve the, the quality of, of everything that we see. So I want to talk now about um, the difference, not really the difference, but SOA and APIs. And I, I call this fearless lessons from the field, things that we have learned over the last year or so. A lot of the work that Ronnie and I do is going to our current customers, talking to them about what they're experiencing, what they're seeing, challenges they have, and what they're doing. And so I have some examples here. But I want to start um, talking about fearlessness for a moment. So this picture is actually pretty close to me. No, it's not me. <laughs> I'm the one holding the camera. Uh, this is my son, who does quite a bit of rock climbing where I live in Kentucky. We have some beautiful rocky areas in Kentucky. And he is a fearless climber, but he's not a reckless climber. Uh, he spends a great deal of time studying, reading materials, reading about ropes, reading about knots, reading about equipment. Spends a great deal of time purchasing and selecting the best equipment he can find, throwing away equipment he doesn't trust, throwing away equipment that doesn't fit well, equipment that won't work for the kinds of work he's doing. And he is constantly practicing over and over, mentally in his head as well as in, in the field. And he's prepared at any one time to change his strategy at real time, right? So study, equipment, practice, the ability to improvise, the ability to make changes in real time. That's fearlessness and that's what we need to do with our API strategies. We don't go in recklessly, we don't go unprepared, we don't go without the proper tools, and we don't go with one idea and stick to it even if it's not working. Right? So these are one of the things that we've learned, and this is especially true in organizations. We've heard this, some of this already today, where organizations already have a sort of a culture that may not be prepared for this new way of climbing. Right? So it may be more difficult. So I've talked a little about myself already, but for those who are not in the previous session, um, I have this personal mission that drives me every day, and that's improving the quality and usability of information on the web. And I work with this great company where my job is to help people build great APIs. It's really a, a wonderful experience for me. So I want to talk a little bit about a challenge, and then we'll talk about what we're doing about it. So you've probably seen pictures like this. Uh, I love when I can use the hockey stick, right? Like, everything was great, and now suddenly it's gone crazy, right? So I have a bunch of these I've collected. So one of these has to do with devices, whether they're handheld devices, workstations, SCADAs, uh, controllers in your home for heating, and so on and so forth. These are growing exponentially right now. We have lots and lots of devices, right? So we need to talk to those devices. We're also seeing lots and lots of applications being created now, right? Lots of applications I can download, and those applications are brought into the organization as well, you know, as well as personal use. Like, organizations sometimes can't even prevent people from, from bringing their own device and putting their own applications on it and using company information on it. And then uh, this from, from Programmable Web, a site that tracks APIs. So we have lots and lots of APIs that are growing as well. Devices, applications, APIs growing exponentially. And this puts pressure on organizations that have a traditional life cycle of building applications, both internally pressure and also externally for their use. So what's driving all this? Well, it's, it's a bit obvious now. The wave that's driving these, these curves is mobility, is devices. The ability that I can have a tablet, I can have a phone, I can have a, a, a small laptop that's just an, an, a netbook. All these, these uh, bits of mobility are forcing change at a much more rapid pace right now, and that requires more agility for organizations. And that's not just agility in software, it's agility in testing, release, uh, interaction with customers, adding new features. Everything starts to go more quickly. If you were here earlier, we talked about this, uh, this idea that Donald Norman has of this execution and evaluation circle. So that circle is getting smaller and smaller and requiring more, more things. So that ability and agility goes together. Now, we want to increase this agility, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we maintain a stable uh, foundation. 
we can't throw things away. We can't stop doing uh, testing. We can't stop doing security checking. We can't stop reviewing things. We can't just start throwing things away. That's being reckless again, right? Not fearless. So we have these challenges before us. So I want to talk about three lessons um, to address these. These are things that we're seeing in clients that we work with and reflections outside our own clients with things that we've studied before. So I want to talk about three ideas. Models and tools, knowing the difference between them, finding the right ones, applying them. Broad experience, well, I'll use an example here. Uh, making sure that you're prepared for lots of different situations. Anyone who tells you there's only one way to solve this problem, you should walk away. There's not one way to solve any problem, right? We're not even sure of the problem yet. So a broad experience in being prepared for that is important. And then I want to talk about a high level view, a thing that we call the use paradigm, U-S-E, and uh, maybe that will help a little bit. So, I want to talk a little bit about these two words. Rest, we've heard this, yes, rest. Hypermedia, we've heard this, yes. We all understand that they're not the same, yes. Ah, yeah, yeah, very good. Right? So rest is a model. I talked about this earlier today. There's a man now 12 years ago, right? More than a decade ago who created this model, this way of modeling systems. So REST is a very handy model for widely distributed systems where you don't control many pieces. In reality, in most of our large enterprises, this is not the way our operations work. We control lots of pieces, right? REST is a model where you don't control very many pieces. Turns out that's very handy in a mobile world. It's very handy in an open API world. It's very costly in an organization where you control all the parts. That model may not fit what you're doing internally. It may. You may be creating an organization where you control less and less, and that may be a good thing. So the big thing about this model is that it assumes things like great distance, great distance in space. Like you could be on the other side of the world and this model still functions. You can still participate, you can still add, you can still test, you can still contribute to the system. Also, distance in time. Talked about this again earlier today. Space and time distance. So six months ago, a year ago, five years ago, this application still works. Right? So this REST model is particularly good for these kinds of operations. This over time feature is also not very common in large enterprises. We rebuild this stuff every two years, every three years, every four years very often. But we may also have systems that we haven't touched for a decade. Right? So now time is important. Building a system that can last over time, that doesn't fall over over time, that doesn't become atrophied like a stone over time is very important. So understanding that modeling is important. We need to model things. We can choose to model our organization any way we want, our infra infrastructure any way we wish. So REST is one model. I spoke earlier today, um, Fielding's dissertation is about how to create your own models. We don't have to accept his. We can create our own. There's some very good, very good reading there. Models are different than tools. So this is no longer some little map here. Now I need to make it, right? So I need tools. Hypermedia is a tool. It happens to be an important tool in this REST model, but you don't need to do REST in order to use hypermedia. There are many cases where I'm using hypermedia services, links and forms, ways to inform clients of the next possible thing to do. I don't have to do all of the other things that Fielding's dissertation talks about to do that. I just need that tool. Now, it turns out that that tool is very much related in its ability to work over space and time. That's why Fielding uses it. Because I can create a situation where, even if you're at a long distance, I can send you instructions on the next possible thing. You're logged in as an administrator, I can send you links and forms that allow you and only you to do things. I don't have to build that into the application. I can send that to you. That's what Hypermedia does. If you're a guest, I can change things. If it turns out our warehouse is down, I don't have to send you the links that say, place this, you know, pick this out of the warehouse. I can control what's possible based on what's happening now, even at distance, and even at a distance of time. Over time, I can add new things to the system. Your, your tools are built to understand what information I'm sending. They're not hard-coded to do certain things. So that's why Hypermedia is a great tool. 
because things change over time in reality. This tree is this tree is this tree. But it's evolved and it's changed. Right? So tools help us turn those models into real things. So having a good set of tools is very, very important. I've just talked a little bit about, about tooling. There are lots and lots of tools, right? We need to think about those tools and how they fit with our models. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about are these three words. Soap, yes, we know soap, right? We know this, right? Crud, have we heard this, crud? Create, read, update, delete. And of course, I'm going to use that strange word again, hypermedia. Right? So, SOAP systems, these are different ways to model, right? So we need a broad experience. A lot of organizations today use the SOAP model to, the SOAP system to model their, their world, right? SOAP is great for exposing components. I build a component, I build a set of classes, a class library, I expose that at a single endpoint and give instructions to everybody, I create a document that tells people how to use this component and I share that, right? It's an excellent way to expose components in the system. The beautiful thing about the SOAP model is it's more than a decade old. It has a very rich and very strong vocabulary that lots of, lots of people understand and lots of people share. It makes sense to use this. Sometimes our clients are required to use this because their partners require it. This is not bad. This is not wrong. This is good. Because we have a shared understanding. This is a way to model the world. The difficulty is that while SOAP is very strong on XML, is an XML feature, it's very weak in this one protocol, HTTP. It was specifically designed not to be tied and not to optimize over HTTP. That's why it's difficult to scale SOAP when you're running over HTTP. It actually works quite well directly over TCP and some other sources. But that's okay, because that wasn't important then. And especially inside your organization, very often this HTTP is not critical. That's fine. But it's important to know that. CRUD has become very popular now. Create, read, update, delete modeling of your world has become very popular now, often used with JSON, right? Angle, we're no longer angle brackets, we have the little curly braces. This is so much better now. But this is good because now we expose all our objects, our users, our customers, our stores, our warehouses, our salespeople, our accounts. So now we share all of these objects. We don't have just one component, we have lots and lots of objects that we, that we use. And we model our world as these objects. And everything is a create or a read or an update delete. I create a report or I read a report or I delete a report. I create a taxing calculation or whatever. Everything is modeled in this way. And we know what this looks like, right? So we've, we don't have the machine documentation that we have of SOAP. We have these long documents that have every function, every possible object, describes the payload. I'm using Google as an example here because they do a very good job of, of documenting their object system. So we have all these objects and all these possible things we can do them and all these methods and we write this into our code and we build this in. Works very good. It's very strong on HTTP. One of the biggest advantages of this model is it does a great job in using things like caching services and intermediaries and proxies and things like this. It's very, very powerful. The problem is now what we have is this big pile of functions. And very often we expect customers, clients, developers, to arrange those functions in the proper order so that an application emerges, right? We're giving them really just blown up object collections, right? So that's good, as long as our clients know what that works like. If you have a very strong partner relationship, this is going to work great. If you keep your objects very, very, very simple, a third party can do this rel relatively easy. If you're doing this all internally, you probably have all the internal knowledge you need. Okay, so let's talk about hypermedia, this other way of doing things. We do see customers doing this now. Um, I have maybe half a dozen customers who are actively working on a project using hypermedia as the way to model their problem domain, not components and not objects. Hypermedia is about messages, about the message I send to you. Hypermedia exists on the network, not at either end. Right? So I may, have a, I may have object storage on my server, I may have file storage on my client, but they share a message understanding. That's all they share. Right? So it's a different way of thinking about it. So now what I do is I document the way the message looks. 
Think about SOAP, those of us who know the technical aspects of SOAP. We know that there's a very strict message structure. This is very good because it makes it easy for me to write a client that understands what I've just received. This is totally the idea behind the message modeling in hypermedia. The difference is, rather than just sending data, I'm now also sending instructions. By the way, you can also search this list. You can also filter this list. This is how you do it. You send them to me this way. And I describe exactly how you do it. And oh, 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 I'm sorry, you're a guest. You can't search today. But you can, because you're logged in. And my messages become rich, richer than just data. Now they're information. Now they tell me not just what, but how. And that's the difference. Clients don't have to memorize how. They just need to look and see. Strong on HTTP, strong on workflow, because now I can actually adjust workflow over time. We have a client that has um, a very large commerce system for, we say, set-top boxes, television, buying movies, buying DVDs, yes? And it's a multi-tenant system. So every customer has different sets of rules about what information is presented, what is collected, and the order in which they pass. They have to burn these into the, the chip, right? They can't keep sending code every day. So they create this hypermedia system where this chip understands the instructions and guides the user to the right place for that user, for that customer. It's one system on the server, one system on the client, because they share an understanding of the message. Right? And some of them, by the way, don't even use HTTP. Some of them actually use satellite service, a binary service, so they're not tied directly to HTTP. Many of the clients we see are moving away from SOAP and using this CRUD pattern. And that's good, if that solves their problem. Some are starting to use this hypermedia idea. There's a, another great reason for using this hypermedia is because of this time factor. Those, those of us who build uh, iOS applications and have to have them approved and validated each time we change them, wouldn't it be nice if I could skip a lot of those validations by sending the instructions on how to change, how to add features, and how to change a workflow in the message, rather than wait for that evaluation loop. And this will become more and more expensive over time. OK, one last thing I want to talk about. So I've talked about this notion of modeling and tooling and broad experience. I want to talk about a high level view, a sort of a, a, a strategy. We know this, uh, do you know this phrase, illities? The non-functional aspects of a system, we say they're non-functional. Truly they are, right? Because they're important to us. So I want to talk about an example of this. Usability, scalability, and evolvability. So we'll talk about this first one. Usability, the use and learn ability of human-made objects. So we've heard several cases today about this, right? This ability to, to create something that's usable. Is it, is it intuitive? Is it discoverable? Does it use progressive discovery? Um, do I give everyone all of the possible options first and hope that they pick the right one, or do I lead them along? Think of an airplane cockpit, right? How many buttons are there? How easy it is to crash this plane, maybe? I don't want to build an API that will crash anything, right? I want to make it so that it's usable. We talked about this this morning. Usability through Donald Norman's action life cycle. Very few of us today write client applications that use this model. Form a goal, decide how you're going to do it, set up the first step, execute the step, look at the results, interpret the results, decide if you've reached the goal, go to the next step. Gamers do this every day. Those, usually those of us who write clients do not. Web servers almost always have to do this, right? Because web servers are stuck and stateless if they want to be HTTP servers, so they do this often. Rarely do I see people writing clients like this. There's bad tooling for this right now. It's a disappointment. So, but usability, focus on tasks. One of the things we tell people when they create systems is don't focus on objects. I don't care if it's called a user or an account or whatever it's called. I want to do something. Create an interface that allows me to do things. Now I'm excited. Now I know what to do. Now I don't even need half the documentation, right? It says, hey, it says, add a document, right? Oh, that's easy. I don't have to do document post or something. I just add a document. I like this. Collect lots and lots of information. I, I can't stress this enough. I do not see companies collecting enough information. We have enough an analytical tools to, to 
discover all sorts of things in the data if we only had it. But very often we don't. And lots and lots of iterations. Lots and lots. Uh, I think at the company in the US, Etsy, I think they do production releases multiple times a day. Matter of fact, it's a bit of an anarchistic model. So somebody decides this feature's done, and they get somebody else to agree, and they say, yes, okay, you release. They don't like go to the president of the company or something and say, no, no, release. Multiple times a day, to part of the system, then another part of the system, then another part of the system. Iteration after iteration after iteration, collect statistics, whoa, well, that's slow. Get rid of that thing that we just did just now, back it out, right? A system that has this ability to look at itself, evaluate itself, tell you things about it, and then you can make a decision to say go or no go. This is what we need. This is that agility. Focus, measure, and iterate. These are the, these are the big, big lessons. Scalability, the idea of scaling well is very, very important as you create a larger and larger system. Handle a growing amount in a capable manner. This is scaling. Notice I have lots of little ones, not one big one. Well, there's not too much more to say on that. Scaling out, not up. You don't want this. Pretty soon he's going to get tired, he's going to fall down, and that's it. You want this. You want lots of robots doing things over and over again. Commoditize your scaling. Make it easy. Make it easy to, do, to add another and add another and add another, and to take one out of the system and to put two more in. Because it turns out, here's the bad news, along with the bad slide, designing scalability in the beginning will give you the biggest bang for your buck. If you get it to the point where all of a sudden you discover that this isn't going well, adding memory is probably not going to help. It's too late. Scale early. This is how HTTP was built. That stupid HTTP that has these crazy chaotic caching rules, that was started from the beginning because that's when it starts. That's when it makes a difference. Scale out, automate as much as you can, and do that automation where accounts scale where accounts in the beginning, in the design. Design from the beginning to have hundreds of these, even if you only start with one. And then evolvability, what we say is the unicorn. Right? Ah, there's no such thing. Right? So we know this notion, this idea of Darwin noticing that things change slightly, slightly over time in nature. How does nature pull this off without breaking? How is it that every new species, that these tiny, tiny variations can exist without dying off? It's because they're just very minor changes, like Etsy's little simple change, right? Do a little change and see what happens. Do a little change and see what happens. So when we talk about evolvability, I talk about two things. We talk expand or extend to stretch. If you need to change something about your, your environment, your ecosystem, your API, almost always you can stretch it. You can add a new optional thing. You can add a new API call to the ecosystem itself. Right? You can stretch it and you can expand that API over time. Sure, some things may never get used again. We say tonsils, right? Or, or, or appendix, right? Do we say this right? You know, these, we don't use these organs anymore. Why are they there? because it's way too complicated to get rid of them, right? However, to version, to turn, is to break. I'm sorry, no, can't go there anymore. So sometimes we think we want to version things when really all we need to do is extend them. Occasionally you need to break all of the existing clients because of a design decision you've made. Twitter's example a few years ago when they suddenly realized that their numbers were too big. So they had to break every existing client in order to rearrange their messaging. Okay, We'd like to avoid that. But sometimes you can't. But know the difference between extending and versioning. Because versions break. That's the idea. Don't create dodo birds. Don't create dinosaurs. Don't create uh, platypus. Right? You know this animal? These strange dead ends. Of, of life that just don't work anymore, right? You don't have to do that. You can create evolvable things. Okay, quick summary. We're gonna continue to be forced into this increasing agility. We still need to be maintain stable systems. All the security, all of the review, we, we still need them. We need to look at the models we have of the world and decide if we should change them. And we need to carefully sharpen our tools and maybe add new tools. 
right? Some places, component modeling is the best strategy for the public world. Others, this object modeling. And still others, this message modeling. Don't abandon one or two and stick with just A or just C. It's a big world. Usability, scalability, and evolvability are things that you should think very strongly about because they matter a great deal over time. And I think I'm out of time, and I just want to say again, thank you very much. Hopefully this has been interesting. Do we have any question time, or we're, we're done? So the question is, why have I chosen to speak about REST as a model rather than a style, which is, it's often referred to as? And in fact, um, style is very, very good. To be honest with you, it fit my particular message today to talk about the way we model the world, but I often, very often talk about REST as a style. So I talk about REST uh, as a style like Swedish modern furniture, pointillistic painting, right? These are just ways of doing things, right? This is, this is right? Yeah? Uh, if I can, a second question. Yeah. Um, moving into an, 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 an hypermedia approach, um, do you have some key factors or some metrics to, uh, to know in advance how much time it will take to design all the methods in depending mm. on uh, the numbers of situations we are facing and the dialogue between the client and the service. Right. So the question is, is, is there any uh, metrics or any sort of guidelines on the effort required to model a system using hypermedia, right, rather than some of these other methods? Is this the right yeah. question? Um, I don't have a good answer for that, and it's actually a very good question. I will tell you that my experience and what I'm learning from others is it isn't just the effort, but it's, the, it's what you focus on that is now different. So um, what you focus on in this hypermedia pattern is creating an environment or a set of messages that will eventually allow you to do other things. So it's a sort of an abstraction above your particular problem. So sometimes that takes a good deal of time. When I work with a client, they don't, it's difficult to create a sort of an abstraction away. So um, there are challenges, but what happens in hypermedia is you simply, you start to design the way you interact rather than the particular problem. So you don't design accounting systems, you design how to talk about accounting systems, which is a little bit different. So I think that, that may give you some idea, but I don't have an easy metric.